All right. I know you guys didn't sleep last night, so if you're going to talk about accounting, it's normal. Okay, I get it all the time. I would be interested to hear what careers you guys are thinking of. It helps me kind of understand how much of this I should get into and how much detail. I have sort of a varied background that I'll get into to where I know a ton about debits and credits, but more recently, private equity, uh, financing deals, uh, anything from home building to startups. And so interested, what are the career paths in here or what do you think you want to get out of today? And I'll try to tailor. Yeah, yeah I'm going to be a general contractor. Also, definitely lots of like cash receivable and internal uh, accounting, but definitely just to hear what external accounting is. So we all have great. Okay. Anyone else? Yeah, I mean, I'm starting a graphic design company with like a retail side of it, I'm starting e commerce and then growing into um, brick and mortar. Hey, anyone else? Yeah. I have a few different startups. They're all mainly animal based. So, dogs and horse riding. Okay. All right. Let me um, just quickly go over a little bit. Does it matter which side I write on? Uh, it does. It does. Okay. All right. Good deal. Um, Okay, so uh, once upon a time I went to college and I got a graduate degree in accounting and my emphasis was in taxation. So like that's where the bubbly personality comes from. And that's why like, I have all these friends um, because I, for a long time I was a tax guy, uh, mostly corporate tax. So um, out, out of school, I moved to Arizona. I worked for Ernst & Young. And I was in the partnership tax section. So I worked with home builders out of Irvine, another part of Southern California. A um, couple of years into it, I realized I don't want my boss's job. So that's a problem. So there's tip number one to you guys, okay? If you don't want your boss's job, you should be thinking about what you would want, okay? So I remember a Thanksgiving break and I got a call from one of our clients and he said, hey, love that you're on our account. We have this position open. Why don't you come work for us? And I was like, yes, sir. Let's do it. So I left Ernst & Young and went to First Solar. It's in Tempe, Arizona. Utility scale solar projects. So you're talking about acres and acres. Right? Nothing you put on your house. So they manufactured solar panels and then did what's called EPC, Engineering Procurement and Construction. And they would they have a separate arm that would design these solar fields. And you can actually make some pretty cool diagrams. You can see them from up above in the aerial view. They can do some cool stuff for that. Uh, that was really interesting. I was on the in the tax department doing the accounting for income taxes. So you look at financial statements on some of these big corporations and you'll have tax expense, right? You would have no idea that it's somebody's full-time job to figure out what that number is. And on the balance sheet, you have deferred tax assets and deferred tax liabilities and other things, okay? That takes an entire team to do. That's what I did. Um, from there, uh, four kids later, my wife's from Orem. There's only so long you can stay away from Utah. So we moved to Utah. Okay. Let me tell you a little bit about um, if I were to backtrack my days at, at the U where I got my graduate degree. I was surprised at how many of my classmates never went into accounting jobs. I was like, wait, what? I thought you like did accounting for your degree, then you went into accounting, and then you just did accounting the rest of your life. And it's been really eye-opening to me just to, to follow up with some of these classmates because they took what they learned in the classroom and applied it to their own businesses. So I love that to hear that so many of you are looking to do something other than accounting. There is life outside of accounting. Um, I, think, I think it's critical for all of you who are thinking about having your own business to at least understand the basics of accounting. 
you have to make money to stay in business. And the accounting and the financial statements that go with it are what tell you how you're doing. Okay. Way more than the five star review on Google. Okay. Because you can get those all day long, but if you run out of money, that review is not too big. Okay. So get a baseline understanding of accounting. And what I think is going to happen is that will be the foundation that you need to understand if the way you're running your business is profitable. Okay. Where I am now, I'm sorry, I'm jumping back and forth. Where I, I am now, I'm in a family office. And uh, actually, let me get there in a little bit. Okay. When I went to Ernst & Young, first job out of college, it was like deer in the headlights, ginormous company, global. I needed a mentor and I got one. Uh, maybe not the best one in the world, but I got one and I learned a ton from him. And at that point, you just take anybody who will listen to you and help you along, right? Um, that to me was helpful. And I'll tell you, the theme I'm gonna to emphasize today is develop relationships. Because someone I worked with in 2007 at Ernst & Young in Phoenix was the person that helped me land my job that I'm at right now in a different state. So there is so much value in developing relationships. It might be the next job that you land as a contractor because you did such a good job on that previous job or you know somebody, that person knows somebody and you, you talk to people, right? Hey, who do you know that does this? And that, that's a big deal. So develop those relationships, it, it'll be worth it. Um, in the accounting world, I live on deadlines. It is nuts. Like March 15th was a pass through or sorry, a corporate tax deadline. April 1st is the tax deadline for Florida. April 15th is generally it, for federal, it's individuals and uh, it's tax day, right? And then six months later, I get all the other extended due dates. Okay. In the middle of there, there's a May 15th deadline for a not for profit return. To close our books, I need to have our audit issued to banks by April 30th. So if I, I start losing my kids' birth dates because I just have too many due dates in my mind, right? Um, so if you're thinking about this world, just know that you're gonna have to plan your vacations around certain due dates, okay? Um, for better or for worse. So having said that, I work like a dog for part of the year, but then I feel like, I have to open up a little bit and take more time off to make it worthwhile, okay? So every company is gonna be different and the deadlines generally don't change, okay? So just something to know about the accounting world. Um, okay, so first solar, let me tell you about, this is the true mentor I have, Steve Robertson, okay? Amazing guy, super quiet, humble guy, really smart. He did more for my career than anybody else has to date. What do you think he did? Any ideas? What would you want a mentor to do for you? Maybe teach you how to be the best. Yeah. Like maybe take his 15 years of experience and try to get it over to me so that I can learn things before I go through it. Totally agree with you. That's what he did. He, he was really busy, but he would carve out time to help me out. Why would you do that? One, he knew that if I was better, his life would be better. So there's there's some selfish motive there, but I just think he's a really good guy to want to help somebody out. Um, I'll always be grateful for Steve Robinson, okay? Find a mentor like that. I mentioned earlier, right, if you don't want your boss's job, then watch out. If you do want your boss's job and he or she's doing a great job, find out how and why they're doing a really good job so that you can do that as well. Um, I mentioned earlier how accounting is kind of the basis of understanding how a company's run. That company, First Solar in Tempe, um, S&P 500, public company, ginormous, it's intense. Um, probably the most stressed I've ever been, but it was also the most rewarding. So I think I'm too old for it now. You, you gotta be younger to do stuff like that. Um, but I will tell you the CFO became the CEO. So it's not like 
uh, you have to stay in the finance realm the whole time. That's how well you get to know a business through the numbers. And that's why somebody like a CFO becomes CEO. Okay. Um, so after I was at First Solar, uh, we moved up here and there was a company that was relocating from the Bay Area to South Jordan. It's a global container shipping company. So you've maybe seen like Maersk, like the big container ships going. I worked for OOCL, short for Orient Overseas Container Line. Public company out of Hong Kong. And so we were the North America office and I believe it's still there, right? In the south of Mulligans, is Mulligans still around? I haven't been up yeah. there for a while. Is it? Okay. Yeah. So that's where we worked. Uh, I was North America tax. So I handled Canada, US, and Mexico tax matters. So same accounting for income taxes and then the tax compliance work. Um, pretty awesome to learn a different culture. Right? I mean, it was awesome. Adam Po Wei Chu was our head of finance, and uh, he was a great mentor to me as well. So uh, he, he was fantastic. I mean, how many container shipping companies do you know are based out of landlocked Utah? Right? That's kind of weird, but uh, San Ramon, the Bay Area, just got too expensive for them, so they relocated. Great experience there. I would tell you those deadlines were real as well. I had to close the books in five days. So 4th of July, you can do the math, right? That's within five days. So I didn't do much 4th of July celebrating. So. That was a that was a bummer. That one told taught me that accounting is a consistent language. So even though I heard more uh, Mandarin Chinese than I ever had before, at least we could come together on debits and credits and what was lining up on balance sheet. Okay. Um, I was going to relocate to Hong Kong for a few months to work with corporate, but the position that I'm at now came up. And I couldn't pass it up. I'm at Blue Diamond Capital, um, family office in Provo. I grew up in Washington State, and I don't know how much you guys are tied to Utah. I used to be from Utah, but I've never been there. Okay. Now, now I I live in Utah, like Lehigh, and I work in Provo. Like, this is completely not what I had in mind, right? But this is a fantastic gig, and I'll tell you a few reasons why. So Ernst and Young thousands and thousands of people worldwide. First Solar, public company with employees from Malaysia, Germany, Ohio, Arizona, um, OOCL, Hong Kong, North America, you name it, global, to now we have eight people on payroll where, at, where I am. It is so small, but we manage almost a half a billion in assets. And three of us are CPAs. Okay. There's that much to do to make sure that we're operating profitably. Okay. So although it's very entrepreneurial, you, you have to know the nuts and bolts of accounting. Um, what's been fun where I am now is it's more entrepreneurial than ever. So I think I mentioned to you earlier that I thought that you went into accounting and then you just did an accounting job and that's what you did. This has opened up my eyes to taking risk taking smart risks and managing risk, okay? So I'm naturally a conservative guy. That's why I went to account, okay? And now I'm seeing what it takes to see what different deals are out there and how we can use our money to not only make money, but improve the lives of so many people in the community. The founders of our company are remarkable people in that they're worth millions and millions of dollars, right? They could sit around and count their money all day but they choose to invest in more businesses because they feel like that will help our community by employing more people. So they don't view it as, here's my net worth or here's how many properties I own. It's more like, look at all of these families that we provide for through payroll because we're operating profitable businesses. To me, that's a huge mind shift. For so many years, it was, how do I make sure that I'm just getting this job right? And now it's a much bigger picture to impact individual families here and beyond the borders of Utah, okay? 
So having set up all of that as a little bit of a background, any questions or things you want me to talk about based on where I've been? It's not like your typical, kind of typical, but not totally. Any questions that have come up? Okay. Um, go through a couple other things. Let's talk about um, who wanted to talk about accounts receivable. Like, do you want to go through the nuts and bolts of receivable? I know it's all right. I right. guess you want to. <laughs> Here's something I'll tell you. As you guys go into the workforce, how many of you do you think you'll be working for somebody, at least originally, or at least initially, and then maybe going to? So you'll be working for someone. Okay. How many of you ultimately want to be the person that people are working? Um, what are you looking for in your employees? Loyalty, dedication, dedication, loyalty. Okay, yeah, those are kind of hard to find. I think people are loyal to the Benjamins. So. Yeah. Um, adversely, I'd like to find someone that's dedicated to themselves. Because if you're not authentic with yourself, you can't be authentic with our company. That's a really good point. Right. Good for you. I like that. Yeah. I want people who actually want to make their dreams come true, like be a graphic designer, be a marketing specialist, someone who's willing to work and learn and be flexible. Great points. Uh, in the back. Yeah, this kind of draws on the previous speaker, but the ability to um, kind of learn quickly, like you only need to hold once, uh, like after two. So, you know, they pick it up really quickly and they can do it really well. You know, just learning fast. Yeah, yeah, that would be super helpful. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, like you said, adaptability. Somebody who can just immediately, I mean, obviously, nobody's going to know what to do like right off the bat. Yeah. But somebody who can adapt quickly to the workplace, somebody who's efficient, and kind of really knows what they're doing. Yeah, I agree with you. Please. Um, compassionate, but also people skills. I don't care if they like people, but they need to have people skills. Okay. Yeah, where were you when I needed you? Good point. When I was running my company, um, I like people that had initiative, but not like too much initiative. I didn't want them to like stay in your lane, but do really awesome work in your lane. <laughs> but that was the yeah, that's a good point. It has to be ordered, that's for sure. Okay, so my question to you then is, are you that employee right now? Are you that person? Because that's going to be key for you. I will tell you, every place that I've started working, uh, I mean, day one's always kind of like, did I make the right choice? I just left something that I know for something that's not known. Um, but what you guys described is what I tried to be as well, and it served me well. Um, and, and again, I'll go back to relationships because even though you want to do a really good job and pick it up quickly, uh, people remember the work, the, the work you did, but also you as the person doing the work. Because we're in a day and age where robots are going to start doing things that humans do, right? I mean, APAR is one of those things. Like there are softwares now that just do that. So we have to be better than bots, right? And a lot of that is what's coming out of your mouth or what you're typing, that kind of communication. Um, if you can do that clearly, you're, you're ahead of the game, even in accounting. Good point. Um, I heard a question earlier about single member LLCs and everything. So where I am now, we actually have an attorney sitting um, in offices, out of our office, even though he's not a payroll. Um, that's a great person to know. So much of accounting and tax is law more than numbers. So a lot of people, when, when they ask what I do, I'm like, oh, I'm accounting. I'm like, oh, you CPA? Yeah. I'm like, oh, you must love math. I'm like, well, actually, I do. But I have way more law in my job than I do math because these things can be math. I mean, great with these things. They do a good job. Okay? Uh, it's usually the operator error in all these things. <laughs> But um, but interpreting law, especially on tax code and things, I mean, it changes every couple of years, right? That's what Congress does. They 
great job security threats like me to change the laws all the time. Um, so yes, creating legal entities is smart. We do a ton of that. Um, our structure is such that we have a, a holding company and then below that holding company, we have this hotel, this strip mall, this home builder, this car dealership. I mean, we have a really wide variety of investments. And so that is, that is um, good to know. And from an accounting perspective, oftentimes we need things broken out by entities in a larger organization, because if they're in different jurisdictions, the rules could be different. So I know in, in Arizona for solar FP and A department, uh, financial planning and analysis, those guys would run uh, models just saying like, here's what the company's gonna do. And it was always this like battle where it's like, but I need it by jurisdiction. And the reason are, you know, there are different tax rates obviously, but it's just helpful to know one that you're separating your liability as well. So for all of you guys starting your own companies, definitely a smart idea to have your own LLC. Uh, I have a single member LLC that I hold some of my stuff in just to create that layer of separation. Uh, but then you also have to honor those LLCs and treat them like they are really are another entity, not just commingled everything on your own. So I'm not here to talk about legal matters, but it's a big part of accounting. Yes. At what point in your life do you decide that yes, count? Oh, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> I was four. No, I was four. <laughs> I, no. Uh, I went to lunch with my dad when I was young. I was older than four. And I, I remember the place. It was a Mexican place. I don't remember the food. It must not have been like awesome. Because I love chips and salsa. It's so good. And he taught me about interest and how your money can make you money. He taught me about interest rates. And my dad's not a finance guy. He's like a history major and boarded horses, like not a finance guy. And that day, it just like stuck in me where I'm like, and maybe I'm just lazy because I'm like, my money can make me money? Oh, then I don't have to work. I like this. Um, that has not proved to be truth okay i'm not here to tell you that you should sit back but there is truth to um financial models that can help you get where you are even planning your own retirement right um i i just started messing around in excel saying okay if this earns this percent that compounds and that earns this like i remember when i made my spreadsheet that said the first million that was like the tab because I'm like, when can I get to my first million? You know, um, I'm not there yet. Nice close. Okay. <laughs> but the spreadsheet won't lie. Okay, that if those models prove out, uh, it's it's doable for a lot of people. According if you just follow the plan. So long answer to your to your story, um, but that's when I started thinking about you know before high school financial management. before high school. Yeah, yeah, and then I took an accounting class in high school, and I was like. Gosh, um not really i wanted to be an architect did the technical drawing class architecture must be awesome what is it so I wanted to be an architect too. You oh, did? Yeah. We're going to start a club after this. So you want to be an architect? Yeah. I wonder what drives us away from that. But... The school inside. Yeah, maybe yeah. that's what it was. Yeah. 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 I don't know if the accounting would be better, but. Um, <laughs> yeah. And then I, I did a community college route up in Washington. Did two years, got my associate's degree, yeah. and then transferred after that. So. Um, yeah, I would say that's what my dad told me was that accounting is the language of business and that has proven to be true. Uh, that's why I started out with, if you know the basics of accounting, you'll know how your business is running and how to make it more profitable. What other questions? I've up any time. Yeah. Uh, did you start companies for your kids so that they could start earning? Money and 
No. Uh, my kids are 16 to 9. I don't trust them. <laughs> <laughs> no, there might be embezzlement, some fraud. Uh, no, there, there is truth to that, um, definitely. I have not gone that route. So. I don't actually operate a business right now, so I don't really have anything to employ them. I feel like they need to do their chores on their own. So, yeah, good question. I do know people who have. Yeah. So drawing on your theme of develop relationships, yeah. can you kind of uh, give some some pointers or something about um, how you, you market yourself and how um, get people to kind of come to you or um, or the reverse, finding people and getting them to listen to you? Yeah. Uh, can you describe? That's a good question. I'm still in the process okay. of figuring that out. But what I found was what you guys talked about earlier on the the type of employee you want to be, that's the type of employee that works with other people in an organization, right? So I'm at my best when I'm helping somebody else and they're at their best when they're helping me. Do you guys do a bunch of teamwork in your other classes? Like, it was like nauseating when I was in school. Like, are we doing another group assignment? <laughs> um, I couldn't stand it, but there is value to that because some people you don't always get along with. Um, but this person who helped refer me to the job I'm at now, we work together in Ernst & Young in Phoenix. That's just a person where we just work together and we felt like we did a good job. And I would say that it's hard to recommend, it's hard to think that somebody else is gonna recommend you for something when you didn't do a good job. So your quality of work will speak for itself. And that's how I feel like, you know, as far as marketing yourself, that I feel like marketing myself is word of mouth marketing because I don't I just don't want to put myself on a billboard. It just seems awkward. Okay, you guys don't want to see my mug driving down the street. Um, but it really comes down to how well did you work with somebody? And that opens up doors. Um, our managing partner where I am now is so connected throughout this valley, but he is nuts. And it's mostly because one, he, he goes to um, meetings and conventions and think symposiums and stuff like that. But it's more probably the quality of work he does and the type of organization that he's created. So our reputation is like 10 out of 10. And you talk to any of the banks that we use, because we, like, you run a company, financing is a big deal. Like most of us aren't just like, oh, there's another couple of grand. Sweet, I was looking for that. <laughs> we need money, right, to make money. And banks have the money. Those relationships are key. We're to the point where that guy can pick up the phone. And this happened a week and a half ago, right before a tax deadline. We had, an entity, um, and without getting into too many of the details, the company had been sold, but it needed to file its last tax return. Well, it needed to pay tax, but they had distributed all the money, so there's no money in that account. Because of his relationships, he called the head of, insert name, bank, I don't know if I could name it, and the, the head of the bank and said, we need an account open today. Done. You don't get that in the banking world. I don't know if you guys have worked with banks, but things take like days, right? Because there's this policy and this policy. But because of the, the relationship and the information on file, uh, it happens like that. So to me, I think you don't get that unless you've had time working with each other and shown that one, I have a great product and I treat you like a human being. Because if you if we ask something of that guy and then we just blow him off in the future, you're gonna want to help us in that. No. And that's where that those are the relationships that will help you out. Um, I would also say being in the right place at the right time sure helps. I'd be lucky ten out of ten times if I could choose. Um, but I read a quote this morning from Gary Player, a golfer. You guys know he says, "The more I practice, the luckier I get." Right? There's truth to that, right? It's not. Uh, so that is key. 
good question. I'll try to think of more examples for you. Any others? Yeah. Why don't they teach us how to use accounting programs and teach us accounting? accounting? Because isn't that waste of time? Good question. Uh, I never touched QuickBooks in my life until I got to this job. But, and it's super user friendly. But because I knew what it should look like on the financial statements, it helped me understand the program. Is that what you're wondering? Like, why not just learn how to do a program? Yeah, why doesn't people just learn how to use the programs? Yeah. You, how would you know if their product is right? Their end result. You have to just trust the system, right? Mm -hmm. At First Solar, I implemented a uh, tax provision software. So I mentioned earlier that it's like an actual full time job just to do a couple lines on the financial statements. We did it all in Excel. I implemented the system. We, we ran parallel like my Excel file with the software for three quarters until we said, okay, I trust this software. Because if it's wrong, that's my job. Like I'm out. The, the, the worst word in accounting is restatement. You have to restate your earnings, like go look for another job. It's just, it's just that simple. Right? So it's a good question. And there are different programs out there. In fact, as I was thinking yesterday about this class, uh, I'm not an IT guy, but I'm wondering, I don't know how many of you guys are into the tech world and all that. I thought a good career in my mind would be like an accounting tech gig because so much of this industry is getting automated. Like most of the, the webinars that I'm on with Deloitte, KPMG, all these big firms, is it's all about a lot of things. It's about automating. Like a lot of these entry level jobs just aren't going to be there in a few years. And so that's why you need to understand how accounting works instead of just a system. How much value do you think you'd be to a company if you just knew a system? Exactly. So if I had a tip for you guys, I think I wrote this down. It would be find a way to add value to your organizations. And you, you, the only way you're going to do that is by understanding what the company does and your role in it. So let me try to explain that better. If I came into a new job, and I was a really quick learner, like you guys were saying, and I picked it up quickly, pretty soon I'm gonna be bored if I have to stay in my lane and only do my job, okay? So I know people who have automated themselves out of a job. Is that a bad thing? Are you adding value to the company? If an employer, or if you as the employer, value that employee, you're not gonna get rid of them because they automated their job. They're gonna say, you are adding value to this company. I'm gonna actually give you more responsibilities. And all of a sudden you're learning more and more about that company than you would have in your normal job because of the value you're creating. Uh, if, if, if we're just able to run a, a software, you're gonna, you're gonna be out of a job before too long, to be, to be honest. Good question. That's yeah. One where you said they, uh, the rules change like every few years because of the government for taxing. Oh, uh, rules. So, so yeah. yeah, so they have to update software, right? Yeah. So who typically does that? Is you have an IT guy or an account manager? Uh, it's it all comes through the tax software. So it's not even it's the software we use. But I want to make sure it's right. So this is actually the first year where I'm farming out the returns. I'm not doing it myself. <laughs> I'm like the happiest guy right now. Uh, but that is, those companies have a big, big group to make sure that the number, the calculations are right in their softwares. So yeah, there's a, the demand is high for that. If you knew how to program that kind of stuff and you have the knowledge of what to do as a programmer, there's a ton of value there. Anytime you can automate or make something better, including accounting, you're, you're a step ahead. I wish I knew a lot about that stuff, but I can't get this thing to turn on. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? These are good questions. Yeah, that's what I wrote down. Utilize what you're learning and your experiences to improve what's already in place. 
place. And that's how you make an impact. Um, my role has changed quite a bit in the six years coming up that I've been in my country. I started as a controller. I was just doing the books, the finances, just putting in journal entries, cash management, cash forecast. And I'm still doing that. We just hired somebody a uh, week before last. It takes forever to hire someone right now. I can't get a good spot. A good job. Um, and he's going to ultimately take my job. I, that's what I want somebody else to do it so that I can go learn something else. If there's something I know, it's doing the same thing for three to five years is not the way to live. It could be four, right? Because you, you want to naturally improve and do something better. So now I'm taking on a new role. So school wise, you only took an associate's? I did an associate's degree, then I got an a undergrad in accounting, and then I did a master's in accounting. Then I passed the CPA exam a year and a half later. That was six or seven. Question. Yes. Did you ever do your own taxes or did you? Yeah. Say this you... is the first year I'm not. I'm a TurboTax guy. Okay. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, I do my own. Is it? I caught one error on it too. Nice. It was nothing, but <laughs> you're the only group I've told. So. Yeah. <laughs> so you don't get bored of it. Um, bored? No, sick of it? Yeah. 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 There's a reason why I'm thrilled somebody else is doing it now. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot to stay on top of. And honestly, I I don't do much consulting. Like this kind of stuff is more enjoyable than sitting behind a computer screen. Right? And the dog days of busy season are just rough. Just sit in front of the screen. It's a lot more fun now to look at different deals that are coming up and how we construction deals and make money that way. Good question. Okay. Can you talk just a little bit about maybe the transferable skills that you brought with you when you took on the foundation? Yeah, okay. good, good point. So where I work now, uh, family office, we manage the wealth of a wealthy family. They made their money uh, selling a phone directory. I don't know if you guys are too young. Some of you may know, like phone books. We used to make great door stops. We used to have to like get the girl's name and then go through the phone book and try to find her. Let's see where she lives. Your her parents' phone number and call her. Um, that's terrible. Uh, they sold that company, uh, U.S. and Canada. What's referred to as an exit sometimes in the financial world. They sold that company. Had a big windfall from that and. Decided, hey, let's let's use this money, and go make more money, and like I said earlier, help build families and communities with this by creating more companies and investing in companies. As part of that, um, they created in 2015 a their own foundation. So it's a private, non-operating private foundation. So a not-for-profit organization. Uh, so the for-profit entity donates to their foundation, gets a tax deduction, the foundation gets to go and support a lot of fantastic organizations like Salt Lake Community College and others. And I would say, you know, I'm gonna, again, I think I have a really cool gig because I get to be part of seeing how the wealth is created and managed, but then also the fun part of giving it away. That's pretty awesome. So I think I'm in a unique position there. Um, I think understanding from the accounting side is really helpful because I can see what an impact, or at least I have a, an understanding, I don't know the details, of where that donation is going to be best used. And so when we say, you know, Salt Lake Community College needs this much money for this project, I can be like, okay, yeah, that probably makes sense based on what I know. And here's probably what it's going to cost. Yeah, that's reasonable. So from a number standpoint, that's helpful for me because I feel like some organizations may be asking for the moon and I feel like you could probably get this much and satisfy the project that you're explaining to me. So from a number standpoint, I think that helps. From a, from a soft skills thing, um, I think it's helpful that I can see how much work it takes to 
build wealth and to make a lot of money. Uh, those are two different things. And I think seeing the impact at an individual level is super rewarding. So I'm going to go off on a little bit of a tangent here, but in all of your career uh, ambitions and things, I would encourage you guys to find a way to give back. And then you'll hear that from a lot of successful professionals. Um, if you give back to the community, it comes back to you. And that shouldn't be your reason for doing it, but um, good things will come back to you. I think it also helps you stay grounded um, because money can do a lot to a lot of people. And I've seen that for sure. That you throw a few more commas and zeros at people and they change. And it's generally, in my experience, not for the better. And I think if you're consistently looking for ways to give back, one, you, you can see firsthand what other people are going through. I think it also helps you remember that I was that person. It wasn't that long ago that I was trying to get by. And across the many weeks, you can live off those things. I proved it. Right? <laughs> They're the best. Uh, that and tuna, like what a well-balanced meal. <laughs> you got protein and everything else. So I went off a little bit, Carrie. You were talking about what I can use from my accounting world to this. Um, is there anything specific that you're looking for? Um, so when you think of an accountant, perhaps it's a general position that you think of a certain hard kind of skill set, the numbers. And uh, the way that you and I work together, it, there is definitely speaking to the numbers and you know it's a budget yeah. and it's true. Um, but there's also a relationship building on it. So I just wondered if you had some thoughts about um, conveying some of your prior skills to that work. Yeah, yeah, it might go back to developing those relationships I talked about earlier. Uh, it's good to be in appropriately uncomfortable situations because that's how you grow. And I was super uncomfortable the first time going in as the director of this foundation, having never been in a board meeting before and saying, all right, I hope we can run this. And it's like, oh, can I get some help? And that was a stressful day, but obviously we have a fantastic board and the real head of the board shouldered a lot of it. Um, but meeting with people like Kara is fantastic because um, you have to have some personal skills. I'm still working on it, okay? You can pull her aside afterward and get the real scoop, okay? Um, but if you're not able to have a decent conversation with somebody, how are you going to get something resolved or accomplished? And so I mentioned earlier, like, what comes out of your mouth or what you're typing, those communication skills are fantastic. And again, I have a long way to go to, to really get this down. But you could be the smartest person in the world, but if you're not able, able to communicate what you're providing to somebody, then it's lost. It's like a startup company having the best idea in the world, but poor management skills. Those companies die every day. There are fantastic ideas out there. Just don't get off the ground if they don't have the right management team. We see that. We've invested in, in a couple of those, and it's a lot more work to help a company get back on their feet than it was to even spend the time to do the due diligence up front to catch it up front. So yeah, I hope you're able to work in these teams to where you're getting along with people that are hard on you. I had somebody lay into me when I worked at First Solar, like out of the blue, it was like, you don't do this and this. And I was just kind of like, that is going wrong right now. I heard part of what she said, and the rest of it was like trying to drown, like, wah, 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 wah. <laughs> like what in the world? And it just came down to a miscommunication. And most of the issues that I've been involved with come down to communication. Whether it's this is my role, this is your role, I'm taking this, you don't need to do that. Um, and that comes with time. So I hope you guys are okay being in uncomfortable situations. Uh, it's not uncomfortable that this would care super easy going like I feel fantastic okay not everybody's as comfortable and respectful as Kara and so you gotta be aware for those situations I guess um what are things that like I'm sure that you've 
met a lot of colleagues and there's some that do really, really good in the field and then really, really poor in the field. What are, give us some of the attributes there. Um, part of it is, I think I can pick up on somebody who was at this job just to get the paycheck. And the people who aren't there just for the paycheck, they work differently. And I can, that would be a, a differentiating factor for me. If you're there for a paycheck, you're probably not going to look for ways to improve the company or, you know, you're not invested in it. That, I would say that's one of the things. The other thing, if I could just pin down one other, probably on what makes people successful in this. Um, follow up on this generalization of like accounting people are nerds, which is totally cool. Um, having personal skills will get you places you'd never go. It's all the stuff you guys talked about earlier about what you want from your employees. That's what, that's what you want, yeah. So like, what would you suggest like for setting up foundations such as like the one you work for? Like, is it better to separate that as a different entity, like a nonprofit, yep. and then donate from your company? Yes, yes, definitely, 100%. Yep. And there are different rules on like whether you're an operating or non operating, whether you're private or public. Uh, ours is the easiest one to do. So you can, uh, but there are rules like uh, our foundation can't own more than 20% of an operating company. So we could not just donate a company in there. Unless we were to sell out our, some of our ownership. So, like, if we wanted to say, like, budget a certain amount every quarter for a fundraiser or to help a startup company, then we would account for that and then donate it to. Yeah. The so, I would say, as far as the foundation goes, you got to have like big dollars. Yeah. This isn't something that a startup would do. You would, you would want bigger numbers. If you're just looking to support or donate a little bit, I would do it straight out of your company and just take your deduction there to wherever, whatever cause you want it to. Otherwise, you're going to have to come up with that because the administrative costs of running that will outweigh the benefits of you donating to a foundation and then from there on. You'll, you'll eat up. That, and that's part of the accounting that will tell you that, hey, here are the costs associated with that. I'm going to water already. Just trying to do good. When a company comes to the foundation to get some help with their startup, what are they bringing a business proposal with them? Are they bringing a pitch kind of, cause maybe one day they'll be in that position where they're looking for investors. So maybe yes. how do they approach you? For Good question. Like As a foundation, we, we donate to other nonprofits. So that, that's the key coming to a foundation. If you came to our for-profit side, Blue Diamond Capital, yeah, we have an investment committee. I'm on that committee. Yesterday, we reviewed three potential deals. And yes, if that's what you're talking about, if you guys wanted funding, some private equity for your companies, you would put together a pitch deck. Here's the management team. Here's our product or service. Here's the, the need in the industry. Here's how we're satisfying that need better than XYZ competitors. We understand these are our barriers to entry and you have to solve all of those in you know 45 minute pitch to a, to a company that that's an entirely different class that you can call me we can talk through any of that stuff but yeah there's a lot that goes into that because you need to you need to convince us as a board that you are going to use our money and make money for us we're not just in the business of handing out money and hoping you guys do a good job. We want a return on it. And that's expensive. That's more expensive than debt. If you guys are looking to capitalize your company, it's probably cheaper to get debt because the bank wants 5%. As an investor, I want 10 to 12. So I would definitely need to bank debt for an investor. And you get to maintain more of your own equity. But it's hard to get financing big dollars when you're a startup it's what your collateral there's the point you guys yes so it's different when a nonprofit organization comes in to you to see good question similar pitch here's our need 
it's just going to a nonprofit organization. So Kara does a great job of saying, here's Salt Lake Community College, here's some of our initiatives that we're working on. We'd love to have your help funding this for that. Uh, and some people like having their names on buildings, right? Others prefer to not have their names on buildings. They want to be a, a quiet donor, which is awesome. And that's where her personal skills come in to know, hey, how can I make this the best for you? Yeah, most of them come in saying, here's the need. Here's some people or here's an industry, and we'd love for you to help us fund this fantastic project. We've done things at Thanksgiving Point with the butter butterfly biosphere. The primary children's hospital that's going up in Lehigh. I care for kids in Salt Lake. A host of others too. Good, good questions. What else? Yeah. In your experience dealing with these startup companies, how did they um, do their market research on finding the, um, uh, especially in unsophisticated industries where it's really hard to rationalize how much people would want something where it doesn't, like the thing doesn't even exist? Yeah, how do companies show that? It's amazing what people think the value is of an idea, right? <laughs> it's kind of like, uh, and so we don't get into too many startups because of that, because that's not our wheelhouse. We do a lot of real estate deals. Um, but you're right, from a startup, I sometimes will hire companies to do market studies instead of here's the market, here's the need, here's how we're meeting that need. But startups are hard. Some of these valuations are straight off of top line revenue. And you're like, but you don't even make money. You'd be surprised how many of these companies you see with billboards, they're losing money. But people are willing to pay these crazy valuations. Yeah, it's a good question. I'll have a long time to that. Does it ever frustrate you being an accountant to see people that are so careless and reckless? Sure. <laughs> yeah. Now you're hitting home. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it is tough. And, and honestly, like I told you about my spreadsheet, right? Like the first million, it's doable, you guys. You just have to be disciplined. You have to be disciplined. So it's hard to give up what you want now for something later. That's tough. That's human nature. But hey, I, I'm irresponsible too sometimes. Not that often. Yeah. yeah. Um, some of our other speakers talked about the importance of bootstrapping a company where you kind of fund it with the money you make from it. Um, and they uh, kind of go with, like are reluctant to advise you to take out SBA loans or get investing. Um, what would you say on that matter? Would you say it's more profitable to try to? Go and get invested or try to work in loans. If you could, if you could keep it going on your own, I think that's awesome. You'll get to the point though where you need to scale to really get somewhere, and that's where you'll need financing. And that's just gonna be your call on how much you want to give up. So if you go the equity route, like we're gonna give you money, but we're gonna want a certain number of shares or whatever, where we have ownership in your company. Because if it's really that good. And you're going to grow this thing. I want a piece of the pop at the end when you sell or you go public. How would you uh, would you advise uh, loans versus uh, investing or angel capital? Or if you can get loans, I mean, this is just me personally. I'd be all about that because it's lower cost of capital. What's tough sometimes is getting that financing from the bank because what's your collateral? Right. They're not just going to give you millions for an idea, right? They'd be out of business pretty soon, too. So that's that's the interplay where at some point you'll have to give up ownership to get the money in the door. I would try to go as long as you could before doing that. Because what's going to happen is that's just more time where you can prove that you have a viable business and that your idea is more than an idea and that you as a business owner, you are the management team. It's going to be, so you, you're proving to them, this is how long I've done it myself. So I really do know what I'm doing. Those are all positive facts to make somebody feel comfortable giving you money to help you go next level. Hope that helps. Okay. And then, then somebody else has one. Okay. Um, 
<laughs> yeah, we're uh, just, our class time is over, so if you guys need to leave, um, please do. But I know sometimes you guys have questions. If, yeah. For, for whatever yeah, you're comfortable good. with, that, that's fine. If you need to go, we yep. can have to yep. wrap up. Thanks for sticking around, you guys. Appreciate it. Uh, I've, uh, I've read a lot, I've heard a lot from speakers in other places that um, early on, uh, if you start businesses, um, they fail to keep uh, track of their revenue and their growth. And so their value at less when they're selling you know, their company or um, scaling it, you know, trying to get investors. Um, how would you advise us to keep track? Would you, would you have us do a journal? Or a spreadsheet kind of recording your income like an accounting yeah so you love it yeah you can get a bookkeeper pretty expensive these days if you because i'm guessing you want to spend the time growing your business you don't want to be dealing with nuts and bolts. But yeah i would definitely and the easiest thing to do is just track the cash it's, it's not like you're accruing a lot of expenses in the startup stage. So if you're if, yeah, if you're allocating where all of your cash is going, you cash in. And that's just on a spreadsheet or do the book. Yeah. Yeah. You could do something like QuickBooks. It's pretty easy, but that's why you want to know accounting before you learn the system. So you know what you're doing, right? Yeah. I went to your website. I'm just confused about one thing. I went to your portfolio. Your family, um, portfolio. I came up, it brought me to Peg Companies. Yep. Is that a capital company? That's a developer. Yep. So we have ownership in Peg Companies and they develop. Question? Yeah. Right there. Oh, they're having dinner. They're going like crazy. These are good questions, guys. Thanks. Anything else? Appreciate appreciate you guys sticking around. Um, they'll have my information. You can pass along to anybody you want for any question. Yeah, so, uh, what do you think was your most valuable skill in maintaining those business uh, relationships and uh, creating new ones? So, do you think it's more interpersonal or some other skill? I think it's the balance between the interpersonal skills and just technical knowledge. Right. Because, uh, yeah, so good to because it's great to develop a relationship, it's even better if we're talking about meat. Right. So it's just like the weather. Right. Where um, where do you typically develop those relationships? Is it normally on the job place or is it like at a dinner party or yes and yes? Um, I'm not like a huge guy that likes to go to these like mix and mingle things. <laughs> but they're helpful. Yeah. But it's helpful to go there and know what you're talking about. Uh, right. So that's why I have that technical skill. But yeah, in a bigger organization, you're going to talk to a lot more people. Right. I'm limited now with seven people. That are, you know, like I've maxed out what's going on there, and I'm learning and hopefully being a mentor to others. Right now, uh, but yeah, I would go to events all over the place if you can and be proactive to say, "Hey, I'm so and so. This is what I do." Right. That goes a long way. Yeah, you gotta put yourself out there. That's the appropriately uncomfortable part I was talking about. Those are good. They're tough. They're good for you. Yeah. So when you joined the solar company, was that an entry level position? No, uh, that was not. No, that was at a senior associate and then tax manager level. So what type of jobs did you take to get to that point? Uh, it was the public accounting. That was entry level. So when I left uh, school. I was entry level at Ernst Young. You know, so doing, doing the grunt work, mastered the copier, the printer, scanner, <laughs> whatever you can do, had that thing down. So, yeah, and then just work up from there. Because you really have to know the base to be able to get it to the next level. Yeah. And when you make your contacts and introduce yourself, how often would you say you should keep in contact with the individual or reach out to them? Um, do you, do you just want to stay in contact or can you let it, you know, talk to them for a while or? I'd say as often as you, you think you need, because everybody's different. Some people are like, stay away from me. And they're like, why are you peppering me? Um, I think quarterly is just like a good baseline. That way you're in three or four times a year and keeping that relationship. If you need to do more, I would, maybe six weeks. But 
really is good. There's a good app called Nuri, N O U R I. It's good for, uh, it's really, if you're running a small business and you want connections, it prompts you, like, hey, you have your stuff to sell it. So, uh, that's a good, good app. Full disclosure, we are invested in that. Tell all your friends. <laughs> we will, you will be reaching out to regular things. Yeah. Yeah, this is good. Thanks, you guys. Great.